He takes the long view, and it's made him billions, many billions. Warren Buffett is one of the best learning machines on this earth. He doesn't even own a calculator or a computer. In the span of 60 years, Warren Buffett turns a small investment company into the biggest finance powerhouse in the world, Berkshire Hathaway. There has never been an investor quite like Warren Buffett. He is the ultimate long-term thinker. His investment ideas are easy to understand, but very difficult to execute. That is why a lot of people have tried to copy him and failed. Warren Buffett is the antithesis of financial theory, which suggests that diversification is the key to investing. Instead, he believes concentration is the key to real wealth. There, there have been times, I mean, we've seen all kinds of ideas we would have put 75% of our net worth in. One such rare opportunity was the Coca-Cola trade in 1988. With this one trade, it returns 1,550% profits. Even from an early age, Warren Buffett has a strong entrepreneurial pedigree, starting his own small business, selling chewing gum and Coke bottles to local children. Buffett's business obsession will be the bedrocks for his investing success. In 1951, he earned a Master of Science in Economics from Columbia, where he learned the art of value investing from Ben Graham. Value investing is about thinking more realistically and logically about the price of assets. The most common phrase in value investing is common sense. Sometimes our gut knows exactly how much something is actually worth. If I sell you an orange for $40, you know it's overvalued. But when it comes to stocks, people tend to lose that intuition. What Ben Graham has taught Buffett is a set of mental models and analytical tools to gauge value of a financial assets. After working as an investment analyst for a few years, Buffett decided to start his own fund, raising money from the wealthy friends of his family. Over the next decade, Buffett becomes a ruthless value hunter. He was targeting a lot of distressed companies with some value left so that he could liquidate or sell the assets. For a while, he almost act like a corporate raider, taking over companies and pumping up their stock price. After assuming control of the Berkshire Hathaway company, he was persuaded by his business partner, Charlie Munger, to change his approach, to instead focus on targeting great businesses with fair value. By 1988, one such business presents them with an opportunity of a lifetime. And this guy, this guy was down on his luck, John Pemberton, who started Coca-Cola in Atlanta, he wanted to make a coca drink himself. And so he made this, originally Coke was actually a wine. It was like a wine of coca. It was a red wine mixed with coca leaves. And then prohibition hits Atlanta. And so he creates this non-alcoholic drink, Coca-Cola. I drink probably five 12 ounce Cokes a day. And that's about 700 calories. Uh, I've been doing it more or less all my life. I can't imagine anybody that feels better than I do. I mean, I'm happy, I enjoy life. When you think about America, there's a good chance that the Coca-Cola symbol comes to mind. By the 80s, Coke has been so integrated to American life, it is hard to see any reason that it will run out of favor. But even great businesses make mistakes. Coca-Cola is about to make a costly one. The stagflation of the 70s has led to the election of the populist president, Ronald Reagan. He was going to cut taxes, and what that was going to do was shrink the amount of available money uh, towards government, which he was then going to also do by cutting spending, uh, and he was going to cut regulations. His expansionary monetary policy has allowed a vast amount of cash to flow into the economy creating an incentive for companies to grow. Consumerism was a big symbol of the 1980s. In the corporate world, a lot of companies come into possession of a lot of cash. Many started out buying smaller companies, but the growth of mergers and acquisitions is not organic. The real long-term growth comes from innovation and risk-taking. 
For nearly 20 years, Buffett has been patiently building his empire through the magic of compounding. By the mid-1980s, Berkshire Hathaway had become a force to be reckoned with in America. But the booming economy created a dilemma for Warren Buffett. For value investors, they're often very conservative during a bull market because everything seems so expensive and overvalued. So Buffett waits patiently, searching for an opportunity to strike. Hey, I mean, are you 100% certain that this won't bomb this new formula? I think, as I said, I think this is the surest move ever because the consumer made it. We didn't. But Coca-Cola was wrong. The new Coke formula launched in 1985, turned out to be a massive failure. By the late 1980s, Coca-Cola faces fierce competition, especially from Pepsi, leading many investors to lose faith in its ability to maintain its market share. To make matters worse, the Black Monday crash of 1987 has led to an even sharper drop in Cola's stock price. Buffett knows. This is perhaps the greatest opportunity to buy its stocks. But after taking a look at its stock price, he hesitates. Although Coca-Cola has a big drop in price, it has grown many times over since the early 80s, and the price doesn't look very cheap. To verify his investment thesis, he consults with his legendary partner, Charlie Munger. Growing in the Great Depression, Charlie Munger always knew he must do what it takes to be financially independent. After making his first million in real estate, he grows his wealth by investing in small quality companies. He's got a much broader and than I do. And he's magnificent at being able to condense some debt and ideas into just very few words. Buffett and Munger realize while Coca-Cola is not cheap, it is generating cash flows like no other, and only spending only a small portion of that to operate. With cash flow, it's possible to calculate the value of a company. If you think about it, what really is an asset if it doesn't generate any cash flow in the future? We are trying to look at businesses in terms of what kind of cash can they produce if we're buying all of them, or will they produce if we're buying part of them? Since they both have studied the company for years, they know how much this company can grow in the future. In this case, even if the business doesn't grow at all, it is still a safe bet. Because Coke has such a strong brand that it's nearly impossible to get rid of. This competitive advantage will allow Coke to remain in business for the time being. By all accounts, Cola in 1988 seems like an opportunity of a lifetime for value investors. Wasting no time, Berkshire Hathaway starts accumulating as many Coke shares as possible. For many, many months, we were buying as much Coca-Cola as we could buy, roughly a third of the volume trading, every day for months. We were very aggressive in buying into Coca-Cola. To own an asset, is to own its future cash flows. That is a source of value for any asset. If you buy a tractor, the value is determined by how you use it in the future to produce more economic goods, such as crops. To Buffett and Munger, there are no better assets than owning companies. The most important components of an economy are companies. You can think of the company as a group of people doing productions. A stock is a claim to the cash earned by that production. Therefore, the only reasonable way to have true wealth over the long run is to own the production of the economy. Warren Buffett believes that there are many great companies today for anybody to invest. But the problem is that they're too expensive. But once in a while, due to factors like economic cycles or some 
temporary scandal, the price of some of these companies will drop. That is a moment for a value investor to buy. By the end of 1988, Berkshire had purchased more than 14 million shares of Coca-Cola at $600 million. But they keep on buying, accumulating a $1.2 billion position by March 1989. The biggest and most concentrated investment by Buffett ever. Coca-Cola's business starts having unstoppable growth. After the international economies open up, Coca-Cola has always been the first to open its business. By today, Berkshire's investment in Coca-Cola has returned over 1,550%. In the history of finance, there are those who make fortunes overnight with just one trade. Many of such can be viewed as just good luck. But then, there are those who consistently make the right investment decisions and whose trades are carefully thought out and executed. These trades have made them a fortune, 